want to talk to you about the path of the warrior spirit. And, and I'm going to share a testimony, but I, before, I, before I actually share the, the testimony in itself, I want to I wanna teach. And I, at heart, I'm a teacher. I like literally want you to get something out of what you're going to hear. <clears throat> so you're going to hear some personal encounters over the last couple of years that I've, I've dealt with. But what, what I want you to get is that, that there's, a, there's probably the greatest time in the history of the United States of America and possibly in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ to pick up a, to pick up a sword that the Lord's prepared for you in a fight. And now how you choose to fight is going to be, going to be between you and the Lord. It's going to be between you and what you hear today. And so I, I want to present to you this pathway that I've personally walked and am still walking. I've not arrived. I've got a long way to go. But I want to share with you some of my, my own struggles. And I want to do it as we look at the Word. And so we, we've got a lot of slides. I don't, I don't necessarily think that Matt does a lot of slides usually. But there's a lot of slides. So I, I'd encourage you to follow along with me. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through a couple verses of Scripture to set the stage. And then after we do that, I'm just going to tie, I'm going to tie into some things with those Scripture. And, and, and what, I, what I really want today is I want you to not hear Derek Jones. I want you to hear my journey, but I also want you to hear what God's saying. So before we go any further, I'm going to pray. I'm going to be emotional. I, I've got Kleenexes here. I do. I, it's just... It's how the Lord's made me, and I'm going to be emotional. I want to go ahead and give you that up front. That just be prepared. If you don't like to see a man cry, be prepared because I'm I'm probably going to cry. But I, I want to I want to give you um, I want to give you a snapshot of what I think the Lord wants to walk a lot of you through. It's according to Scripture, but but my journey will have a lot to do with what we see today. So we're going to pray, Father. We thank you today. Um, Lord, we, I, I come before you humbly. I know that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And I need your grace today to, present what you've put before me. And God, you know what the people here need. I don't. I'm just a messenger. I'm the vessel. And Lord, we ask that you would fill this place with your power, with your spirit, and help us to walk away from here challenged, challenged, not angry, not full of resentment, not full of bitterness, but challenged. And Lord, as we open up our hearts to you, we know you will fill us with what is good and honorable and merciful. And so we ask you to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to challenge you today, first of all, by telling you um, we're all called to be warriors. If you have accepted the call to follow Jesus Christ, you are, you are, you have, and are currently in a battle. You're in a battle for your soul. You're in a battle for your spirit. And never let somebody tell you that the Christian life is always going to be easy. It, it, if anything, it's the exact opposite. Because if we were to stand up and preach the message that we a lot of times preach from the pulpit today and Jesus were to be in the audience, he would think we're talking about something absolutely contrary to the life he lived. And yet we beg for peace and mercy and we beg to have, have everything given to us in this westernized civilization that we live in. I'm guilty. It used to be where the remote control was an amazing thing. You didn't even have to get out of the recliner. Now you can click a button and have them deliver food to you. Now you can click a button and have them deliver your Christmas packages. It's just like we've got this, this world set up to cater to us. I'm not necessarily sure that we, myself, have Christianity fully figured out. But I will tell you one thing. It's not as we see it today. 
And I, you're going to be challenged. I, I mean, it's, it's a challenge for me to even preach this. And I'm going to say some things today I've not said from the pulpit at Catawba Baptist Church. I'm going to say some things today my family's never heard me say. But in order to do that, there, the, God's, God's he's, he's elevating. He's elevating our thinking. He needs us to think how he thinks. And what I want to do is prepare you for the two chapters or the two two scriptures that we have first on the screen is Isaiah 41 and I just want to walk you through one of the more familiar texts in Isaiah and it's in verse 10 but we usually we get that one and we stop there because that's like the good one because God's like don't fear I'm gonna come fight for you and we don't read the rest we never like to put things in context especially when the context around that one good verse has a little bit of hardness to it but we're going to read through this And I want you to see something that God started showing me about four, four and a half years ago in my own life. He started teaching me what he's called me to be. This warrior, this this thing that we're going to see is on God's heart for not just Derek Jones or Matt Rummage, but for everybody that's ever accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I'm going to walk you through this text. It begins in verse 10 of Isaiah 41. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, that's just a powerful verse. And not to take anything away from that, but if you just pull it out of where it is right there, it's powerful. But I want you to keep reading, and I want you to see something interesting. Look at verse 11. Behold, All those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. Look at verse 12. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing as a non-existent thing. Verses 11 and 12, God is setting up Jacob, the children of Israel. He is setting them up. And what he is saying is, I'm going to ask you to do stuff that you can't do in your own power. And you got to know that you don't need to fear because I'm going to be with you. But here's what's going to happen. And this list in verse 11 and 12 literally shows what's going to happen. Even those that fight against you, Israel, and war against you, they are going to be as nothing, and it's going to be as if they never even existed. Amen. And what do you see? All throughout history, God is dismantling and destroying the enemies of his people, beginning with Egypt. You say, well, God doesn't do that. I beg to differ, because history proves itself. And here, God is wanting the people of Israel through the mouth of Isaiah to tap into something that they're missing. And so in verse 13, look what happens. For I, the Lord your God, I'm going to hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Now notice 14. Fear not, you worm Jacob. A lot of ways we can read into that word worm I would like to present to you today. I think it's just the process of the beginning stages of possibly a grub which would, or a caterpillar which would eventually turn into a butterfly. Here in its beginning stages, God is calling out the people of Israel, the men of Israel, and he's saying, don't fear I know you feel worthless right now. I know you feel like there's nothing you can do right now. But look what he says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says this. And in 15, behold, I will. Now look at what he's saying he's going to do. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. Think about this. You people of Israel, you people of God, I'm going to sharpen your teeth. It ain't going to be fun. But I'm going to sharpen your teeth. And I'm going to create in you a a machine that's going to eat up all that which stands against you. Basically, God's saying, I'm going to make you into a destroying machine that's going to take down all the evil, that's going to destroy all the enemies. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day when that enemy, the accuser, the serpent of old, is literally dethroned. And the only time that's going to happen when Jesus Christ steps back on this to reign, this earth to reign a thousand years. But I'm going to tell you today, that, that liar and that thief and that killer of the soul and flesh of man is already destroyed in the name of Jesus Christ. God is sharpening our teeth. And in verse 16, I love it, sharpening our teeth to destroy the mountains. And look what it says is going to be done about the mountains. You shall winnow them, those mountains that are before you, the impossibilities, the authorities, the evil authorities, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness in the air that are trying to kill you and trying to kill me, trying to keep you from doing what God's asked. I'm going to do a work, and I'm going to create you to be a vessel that can move forward. I'm going to create you to be a warrior. And he says, you shall winnow them, those mountains, those authorities. The wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel as if there was nothing left. Four and a half years ago, I literally almost took a full year of listening to Isaiah 41 almost every day repetitive repetitive it was like my hallmark verse God's gonna do this in Derek Jones I'm gonna do this in you Derek I'm gonna do this in you and I'm like okay Lord let's do it let's do it little did I know that the path to being a warrior a lot of times is painful it's painful it's not easy Nobody is able to compete in the Olympics, as Paul would even reference, without having to do a little bit of sweating and bleeding and fighting and contending and practicing. And the same is true in the spiritual world. Now, fast forward about two years, and then God started sharing with me in my heart this text in Judges 6, where we pick up with where Pastor Matt has been. In Judges chapter 6, I want to read to you verses 11 through 15, and I I want to do a little bit of ad-libbing and paraphrasing. I believe God gives us absolute freedom to see the Word the way we see it. But it has to be lined up with Scripture. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a Derek Jones paraphrase as we read through Judges 6, verses 11 through 15, more than likely where Matt started a couple of weeks ago with his text about Gideon. And when God showed up in Derek Jones' life and compared me to Gideon, I'm going to show you what I did. Here's what it says. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to this man Gideon. And he said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You mighty warrior. Now I want you to notice Gideon's response, which would be any of our response if we were in that situation. Gideon said to him, Derek Jones paraphrase, I beg your pardon? You you said what? I'm a what? I'm a valiant warrior? I beg to differ. Now, I want you to notice what happens in 13. Gideon said, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us, and where are all his miracles that that we've heard about of old? He says, did the Lord not bring us up out of Egypt? Think about this for a second. Hear what Gideon is saying. God says, you're a warrior. Gideon says, there ain't no way you got the right guy. There's no way you got the right guy. Why do you not have the right guy? And then Gideon goes on, and he goes on, and he presents this to to the Lord in verse 14. Here's what he said. Then the Lord turned to him. I'm sorry. Go back to 13. I'm sorry. Here we go. Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So here Gideon is trying to find all kinds of ways to tell God he's not ready to be a warrior. He says, I'm the, I'm the least, 
I come from the least land in Manasseh. He says, I'm the least in my father. My father's clan's the least, and I'm the least in my father's house. As if he could find any other excuse to not accept the role to be called a warrior. And there's a lot of you in here today that are reluctant to accept the role to be called God's warrior because you're giving him all kinds of excuses why you can't do it. You don't know what I've done in the past. You don't, you don't know. And this is where I was. This is where I was many years ago when God came in and began to teach me about what he saw about me that I couldn't see about me. And notice verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and he said, it's as if God didn't even hear Gideon's excuses. And God said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And then 15 says, so he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So when God puts the burden on you to be a Jesus, to be the Christ, to be a, a helper as Jesus was for a people, to be a warrior for a people, it should humble you. It should cause you to be a little frightened. For me personally, what I want to do today is I, I do want to share a testimony. And as we move forward today, I, I want to share a couple of things with you about testimonies. The, the idea of where I want to go today as I share this with you is I want to present two things to you. On the screen there, you have these two words, which are from 1 Corinthians 14, which we'll read in a second. But these two words, exhorting and comforting, better translated exhorting is the word to come along beside of and kind of give a, a kick in the rear. That's really exhorting. It can be translated encouragement. It's more of a, let's go, let's get moving. And then there's the idea of comforting. We'll see it through divine discomfort and divine comfort. Think about testimonies for a second. Here's what happens a lot of times. This happened to me. I hear it from hearing a lot of other people's testimony. What tends to happen is we embellish our flesh so much telling a testimony that it almost becomes about Derek Jones's story instead of what Jesus Christ did. And we have to be careful about that when we're telling people about where we've come from. Here, a testimony without the Holy Spirit and the transforming power of Christ can't really impact anybody's life. If you don't put the death, burial, and resurrection into your testimony, friends, it ain't going to change a soul's life. Because it ain't, it's not my story that's going to change your life. But God can use my story of how the Savior comes along beside of me and, re and rescues me and redeems me. And as I give him praise for what he's done, we begin to see that. Next slide. So usually these testimonies a lot of times embellish the human and they don't embellish the divine. God's not seen. Thus, let me give you an example. A lot of testimonies are I used to do drugs. Used to, used to drink a lot, used to party, used to have all. And we get up here and we literally embellish our past that God's crucified. I've done it. And I could give that testimony. God doesn't want a testimony to embellish our flesh. It doesn't need to be about all the bad I've done, although there can be power in that. Here's the power of the testimony. Look at the next slide. If, if you don't know this verse, I would encourage you to put this on your heart. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he stopped me and he said to me, you must not do that. Next slide. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who have and hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God alone for the testimony of Jesus, not the testimony of Derek Jones or Matt Rummage, but the literal telling of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I love the Amplified, which gives a little bit of, it, it, it brings some light to the Greek. That idea is talking about his life and his teaching. 
which are the heart of prophecy. Now go to the next verse. As if you're going to be afraid, I'm going to talk about something that doesn't exist, prophecy. No, it greatly exists. And it's not necessarily talking about end times. you got to get this to get the testimony idea. If the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, then what in the world's prophecy? Well, here it is. 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may what? I didn't say it. Especially you may prophesy. Next verse. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Look at the next verse. Here's your definition. But he who prophesies speaks what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort. So if the testimony of Jesus is real, then this is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to edify you, it's supposed to encourage you or exhort you, and it's supposed to comfort you. That's what a real testimony of what God has done in somebody's life is supposed to do. Does that make sense? So now what you're going to get to see is how the Lord has developed this in me. So the first thing we're going to talk about as I give you a snapshot of, of my testimony is the divine comfort, this idea of his comfort in darkness. We're going to look at these couple of verses of Scripture, and then I'm, I'm going to give you my testimony of COVID. And, and I have a testimony unlike many others because a lot of you have never had it yet. I think the percentage is still 15 to 18% of all the population of the United States has actually had COVID that they know of. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But I'm not going to embellish that because there's something greater that happened. I want you to think about this for a second. Most of us don't know the comfort of God because we've never been in darkness. A lot of us don't know the comfort of God because we won't allow God to help us see the darkness. Because we're going to just suppress the darkness because it's bad if we say we're really struggling with something. And so you don't get to experience divine comfort if you deny the darkness that's around you. God's never told us to deny the darkness. He's told us to allow the darkness to lead us to trust the light. You'll never truly see Jesus Christ as the light of the world until you're really in darkness. Amen? Now, I'm preaching a little bit, and I get one amen back here in the back. It's all good. But I want you to think about this idea for a second. I want you to think about this idea of light. Light does its greatest work in darkness. And if you and I will not admit that we are in some darkness, the light can't come in. It's called integrity. We, we, we think honor and integrity has something to do with how good we act. It's not. The Hebrew idea of these are the literal this is who I am, God. This is the real me. This is really what I'm struggling with. That's true integrity. That's how David walked, open before God and man. And I'm going to open my heart up to you today as I tell you a little bit about this idea of finding this divine comfort. Psalm 23 if you have your Bible, turn there with me. Beautiful text. This is the most well-known chapter in all of the Bible. This is the most well-known verse in probably all of the, all of the Bible because if you've been to a, to a funeral, you have heard this read. And in Psalm 23, verse 4, here's what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want you to think about this from a, from a sheep's perspective. You realize we're the sheep. I actually had somebody get offended at me many years ago when I was preaching and called the sheep a dumb animal. They are. They are. They have to have a shepherd or they're dead. They have to have a corral, a fence, or they're eaten up. We are that sheep. Here, this sheep walks through the valley of the shadow of death. As David, the, the, the psalmist, the king, is writing this, he writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
It says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want you to notice a couple things here. Death is lurking, but death hasn't shown up yet. You realize that? Because he walks through the valley of the shadow. Death is lurking. It's hounding him. He's afraid of it. He's afraid of it. But it hadn't shown up. Friends, may I say, until you're afraid of death, you're going to have a hard time finding divine comfort. Let's go back three and a half months. Something that I've never shared even with my family. As I started, uh, I, I got COVID and it was first, second week of November and I was laughing it off. I was, I mean, no, no big deal. And about a week after I'd been quarantined from my wife for two weeks, basically, and quarantined and doing what I was supposed to do, I, I started developing an issue with breathing. And it wasn't bad. It wasn't terribly severe, but something wasn't right with me. So we ended up going to the hospital one Saturday night. I texted a couple of people and told them, say, hey, just be praying. Something's wrong. Something's going on. And I went to the hospital, waited there for six hours that night. Like literally, death was all around me. I could see people that were a lot worse than me. And I left the hospital that night, and the doctor basically said, you're a healthy guy. I think you'll be okay. Got not one prescribed. I did get cough medicine. They prescribed me cough medicine. But did nothing for me. Said I was going to be okay. And so my anxiety level went down a little bit. But then I came home that next, that next day on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And, and I thought I was getting better. And I kept thinking in my mind I was getting better. But I was getting worse. I was getting weaker. I was losing weight. And one night, never forget it for the rest of my life. I mean, I've had some amazing experiences with God Almighty. But I've had some demonic experiences with the devil. And one night I woke up, and my wife doesn't embellish anything. She don't let me even talk. Like, I'll catch a fish that big, I can't even do that, or she'll call me out on it. It's like exactly, it has, I cannot, I cannot make it bigger than what she thinks it is because she's going to call me out on it. And I know when my wife gets upset, and when my wife has issues um, and she sees things, it's real. And one night, there was a couple nights, she was actually, she would touch me to see if I was still breathing. And one night I woke up, and I kid you not, I heard a demon say, I'm going to kill you. God don't say that. But I heard a demon say that. It was, in my, it was in my spirit. It was manifesting itself with, with just an, a darkness that was overcoming me. I could not control it. And I, I heard that. And I, I heard that. And about that time, the next couple of days, I just I started to lose almost consciousness with reality. And the brain fog set in, and, and, and I felt like I was alive, but I sure felt like I was dead. Just because my mind wasn't right, and my mind has to be right because I'm a preacher of the word, and I, I can't stand up and not have my mind right, can't stand up and preach. And so I went through this battle with this COVID complex for weeks, and I truly at that moment felt what it was like to be in the shadow of death, in the valley of the shadow of death. And I had a decision to make. I was either going to continue to allow death to speak and darkness, or I was going to begin to let the word of God and the light of God come into my life and begin to change me. And that's what happened. That's exactly what began to happen in my life as I began to realize that, that God is with me. His rod for correction, his staff for comfort, they're with me. I love Proverbs 14, 32. The wicked will be thrown down in his trouble, but the righteous have refuge even in the threat of death. Let me tell you, I had refuge. I had a choice to make, though. 
I was either going to continue to listen to what the enemy wanted to do to me, or I was going to have to trust the Word of God and what the Word of God was saying about me, just like Gideon. I ain't your man, God. Look at me. I can't be what you've called me to be. As if God just ignores that about Gideon. Come on, you're the one I've chosen to save my people. Second Timothy 1 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let me say this to you about fear real quick. I'm going to tell you the dif- difference between fear that God puts in us and fear that the world and the enemy puts in us. Here's how you know the difference between whether you're trusting God and fear still comes in and whether you're trusting your flesh, listening to the enemy and fear. Here's the difference. Is the fear you're feeling paralyzing you? If the fear you're feeling is keeping you from doing what God has called you to do and what he has spoken in his word, friends, then that is disobedience and that is the fear that leads to death. And I'm just going to say this. That's what COVID has done with a lot of people. That's what it tried to do with me. If you are afraid to the point that it keeps you from doing what God has called you to do, then friends, you need to repent of that fear because it's wrong. And I'm looking at a body of believers every Sunday, looking through the screen at Facebook Live with several people watching from out of state, crippled by fear. And coming to the building ain't really what even the answer is. Because you realize there's there's a lost world that's dying and going to hell and us Christians are in our little huddle we well we're safe here we can we don't have to wear a mask we're safe right here but you wouldn't dare go out into the world if God asked you to to proclaim the gospel to lost and dying world that kind of fear that paralyzes you from doing what God has called you to do in his word and what he's put in your heart friends that's a sin and that's what the church of Jesus Christ is battling at this very moment So I tell you, as I did in the video I did several weeks ago, if God tells you to wear a mask, wear a mask. If God says, hey, it's okay, and you want to trust him with it, trust him. I I don't know any other way to explain this, but I will tell you, this ain't got nothing to do with a mask. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's a distraction. The enemy is sent and God has allowed it because he's trying to wake up his warriors. And his warriors are sitting there huddled, unwilling to say, ready, break, and go to the line and say, set, hike. If that's that's you today, then may God give you divine comfort because you need it just like I needed it. And then the last thing, that I'll share with you is divine discomfort. As we talk about the exhortation part of this, the the exhortation part of this where where God literally comes along and and just gives us a kick in the rear. Um, Let's go to get us moving, to get us going. What is divine discomfort? I mean, does God make us discomfort? Does God make us uncomfortable? Yeah. Just like some of you right now are uncomfortable with what you're hearing, I don't necessarily think it's the devil. I think it's God. Because you know where you've fallen. You know who you are, just like I did. So God comes in in the middle of that COVID experience with me, and he just starts lovingly, ah, you don't need this, Derek. And he's just chiseling in a way, and he's, he's sculpting this clay, him and the potter. And he's just doing a work, and he's doing a work. And I love what James says. As I have wrestled with this for years and didn't really come into full 
acceptance of this until a couple of months ago. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So what was being tested in Derek Jones? My faith, my faith that I stood up and preached about for 20 years, full-time ministry for 20 years. Been at Catawba Baptist over 15, preaching almost every Sunday. God's challenging my faith. And he's also developing me as a warrior. He goes on, and look what it says. If, consider, consider your trials something to celebrate. What? So I want you to do something with me real quick before we read any more of this. I want you to close your eyes real quick. And if you're not currently in a trial, I want you to go back to the trial that you've been in. And I want you to ask the Father, how did I handle this trial when I went through it? And if you're like me with the majority of my trials, you'd probably give yourself an F some days. In that trial, you can look back up. In that trial, in that testing, that's what God's doing. What's the enemy mean? He wants it to be evil. He wants you to stop. He wants you to turn around. He wants you to go back to where you came from. He wants you to any, do anything but move forward. And here what we're beginning to see is what James is saying is you've got to consider these things as something joyful. Why? Because they're producing something in you that you'll never get it any other way. Do you realize that endurance and patience can only come through one thing? Patience and endurance can only come through testings and trials. That's it. So if you're an impatient person, be careful how you ask God to give you patience. He goes on and he says, let patience have its perfect work as if we just are to stand back and watch God work through the trial. That you may be perfect and complete. It's about maturing you. It's about creating in you that warrior spirit. Lacking nothing. Verse 5 of James 2, James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach. And it will be given to him. The idea of patience here is the willingness to literally submit to something. Um, the idea is submit to the trial. You say, well, I don't want to. Well, that's God's will. Who do we see do that? Jesus Christ. God, I don't want this cup. He's in the garden. I don't, I don't want this cup. I know it wasn't that flippant. I don't want this cup, Father. I know what it means. You're going to pour your wrath out on me for the sins of somebody, of an of, of ungodly world. I don't, I don't want this. And then all of a sudden, it's as if the Holy Spirit infuses Jesus Christ, and he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. How quick are we to run from discomfort? Because we, we, we believe that that. We're Christians and everything should always go right. We're Christians and nobody should get cancer and nobody should get disease. And what if God's doing something amazing with that trial? And then I give you as I wrap things up today, the Exodus challenge. Not sure you're familiar with Exodus twenty twelve. I really wasn't four and a half, five years ago when the Lord proposed this in my spirit. But my father was diagnosed with early onset dementia at about 59 years old, taught high school for many years, a phenomenal calculus math teacher at Newton Conover. And we, we watched him slowly progress. Thank God it was, it was slow, but at the same time, you know, that's a horrible disease. And as, as my dad was getting worse, I realized that my time spent at my mom and dad's house, we had moved less than a half a mile away about a year and a half before my dad was diagnosed. 
go figure. Um, and, and I was close. I could go help when dad would start really having some major issues. And, and one day my mom had proposed to me that she needed to get away. And that was probably almost every day. Mom's here today. Um, just needed to get away from that burden. If any of you have ever dealt with that, you realize that that, that is a, a, just a, a challenging challenging thing and I'll, I'll never forget what the Lord said because I was wrestling with what my mom told me she needed me to do which is bathe my dad wipe my dad's self his rear end when he uses when he finished using the bathroom and go to the bathroom with him and help him I'll, I'll never forget this I'll never forget this just like that old ungodly demonic spirit told me he is going to kill me a couple months ago I'll never forget what the Lord said to me he said I'm going to teach you how to honor thought, what? I'm going to teach you what honor truly means. So to me, at that very moment, to honor your father and mother literally meant to come into the very situation that they were having, that they were dealing with, and be all I could be for my father at that time. Knowing that I was going to have to do something, I hope, no, no. daughter or son would have to do and yet through that process I can remember the discomfort I had with just I didn't want to deal with it I didn't like the fact that my dad couldn't even figure out how to get through the bathroom door to use the bathroom let alone have to deal with with these complications and the whole time the father's telling me God Almighty's telling me, I'm going to teach you something beautiful through this. And if you read that law, that commandment, it is the only commandment with a blessing attached. And Jesus alludes to it. And here's the blessing attached to it. If you honor father and mother, you will live long. Well, that's an Old Testament. I don't care. It's the Word of God. What's God developing in me? He's developing in me a passion to honor my father, but what I don't realize is there's a blessing attached. So the enemy tells me three months ago, I'm going to kill you. What do I have to go back on? Well, the word of God says, if I honor my father and my mother, I'm going to live long. Just one promise, not to mention, not to mention the fact that he's going to be with me no matter what happens, the father, the good shepherd. I could go back to the literal word of God that I was blindly obedient to to honor my father in that challenging time and I could use it to fight against the enemy when he showed up that day. And I, I, I believe with all my heart that the way the enemy could not take my life in COVID is because I was protected, yes, under the blood of Jesus, but also under that promise in Exodus 20, 12. And so my challenge to you today is God wants to put a sword in your hand. God wants to sharpen your teeth so you can become something that can thresh, something that can tear down the things that stand against you. A lot of you in here today, you're struggling with sin. Oh, oh. That was a prophetic word, Derek. We all know that. So one thing God wants to develop in you in order to be a warrior for him is literally going to help you have the way paid for you as you move forward for the sake of other people, as you pick up the sword to fight for others. God's going to fight your battles. He's going to fight those addictions that you have. He's going to fight that anger. He's going to fight all of that anxiety and stress because he knows if you can get free from you you can be a benefit to others that's the power of the warrior spirit a lot of you have been through more dark challenges than i have as a believer in christ may i propose to you that those challenges that you have gone through were there to prepare you to be who god's called you to be gideon no i'm not God says, yes, you are. No, I'm not. And no, he wasn't. But guess who made him into the valiant warrior? God Almighty.
I love what Charles Spurgeon says about the discomfort of trials. He says, I have looked back to times of trial with a kind of longing not to have them return, but to feel the strength of God as I have felt it then, to feel the power of faith as I have felt it then, to hang upon God's powerful arm as I hung upon it then, and to see God at work as I saw him then. See, there's something intoxicating about trials for a believer because in the trial, you meet the Holy Spirit of God. In the trial, you meet the light of the world, Jesus Christ. In that darkness, you're able to see that God has prepared a sword for you to pick up and not to fight against politicians, not to fight against what you think to be right, but yet God, as I've been seeing this over the last couple of weeks, Jesus was a warrior. No, he wasn't. No, not according to what we think a warrior is. Jesus loved the homosexuals. Didn't agree with them. He loved them. He loved the adulterous woman. He even loved the ones that wanted to kill him, kill her. How was Jesus a warrior? He picked up the word of God, the sword of the spirit. He had it in his mouth when he dealt with the devil in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. How was Jesus a warrior? He fought with love. He fought with compassion. He fought with peace. He fought with grace. What was he fighting against? The homosexual agenda? The transgender agenda? Ungodly. I don't believe in it one bit. But just because I don't believe in it, doesn't mean I need to pick up a sword, run to the Capitol, and fight for it. Now, if you want to do that, go ahead. I love patriotism. I'm going to tell you, that's not the kind of warrior God's creating because if it was, it would be contrary to the man, Jesus Christ. And we never see Jesus pick up a physical sword because his battle wasn't against flesh and blood. It was against principalities and rulers and the powers of the darkness and the evil world. So what are you doing to help our nation? Well, I've got this plan and I've got that plan. May I tell you, please get on your knees and pray for those that you would consider enemies. You want to talk about the first step to being a warrior? Pray. How do we pray? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, I say love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Lift them up to me and I'll change them. Yeah, but Lord, you don't know what she said about me. I don't like what she said. I'm going to, no, you don't fight that way. The warriors God wants to raise up are the ones that see what's happening in this dimension and in that dimension and are able to hold back the demonic forces that are able to see people's lives changed and pray in a way and to believe the word in a way that literally changes people's lives. You see, God is doing a divine whittling on many of us, and we just don't understand it. We just have fought tooth and nail. God, why am I going through this? God, why am I going through this? I've said that myself many times. Why me? Why me? Why not? I'm going to tell you, whenever I said this, whenever I actually, and, and, and I'm, I'm finished, when I, when I actually started to believe that God really wanted me to be a warrior, I didn't really know what I was asking for. I didn't really know what I was praying for. And last week, Pastor Mike, we'd started a new, uh, we'd started a new series on the goodness of God, and he preached. He opened it up last week, and I was sitting there taking notes. And completely out of context of what he was preaching, I, I want to read to you what I wrote down. And it was at the end of the message, just the Lord was speaking in the message. But he, this, this is what I heard the Lord speak in my heart. God told me I'd be a warrior. And the question mark is, what has happened since then? God told me I'd be a warrior. What's happened since then? He's whooped my butt. God don't do that. I've got three boys sitting right here. And I'm going to tell you, 
If I know they're doing something wrong, they might not get a whooping because they're a little too old maybe for it. But if I see them doing something that's a little contrary and could literally literally lead them down to the path of death, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do everything I can to get them back on that path of righteousness for his namesake. Why would we think God wouldn't do the same thing? Friends, the trials are for our benefit. We need to have the world, the lost world, looking at us that we call ourselves Christians and saying, how in the world? Is that dude still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ after all the hell he's been through? How can he still trust God after all? That's what we need the world to see. And so as as we close, I'm going to pray, and then I believe April's going to sing Good, Good Father. And I'm going I'm to close in prayer, and I'm going to encourage you. I, I want you, I know I'm, I'm very visual when I pray, I'm very visual when I, when I even try to teach and preach. And I, I believe God's laid some swords down in here. He's got them laying around. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist when it comes to thinking that God's going to make you do something. But I will tell you, you're going to have to choose today. You're going to have to choose. Because some of you know what God has said to you and you know what you're supposed to be and you are running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. And God's laid the sword down and he's saying, will you accept the call to be a warrior? And I don't want you to be afraid and see that my story is going to become your story. Fear isn't the way to become what God's called you to be. But some of you in here need to pick up that sword and you need to learn and you need to grow and you need to see what God wants to do in your life because you got a story to tell. And you got a way that God has impacted you and used your life and wants to use your life for other people. So, Father, today we just give you praise, Lord. We thank you today, Lord, as, as uh, the prayer you gave Aaron, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace, Lord. I pray that over the people here today. Lord, I also ask. That, Lord, as, as you, I, I just I see that you're digging in the hearts of people. It's just like you're the tiller and you're tilling up that, that, that hardened soul. And you're trying to get us to see that there's a calling on our life to pick up the weapon, the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. And to use it in a way like you, Jesus, did. Not to kill, but to love, but to pray to trust you. And Lord, if, if there's nothing else that's heard from, from, from this message, testimony, Lord, I pray your word would ring true. I pray your word in Isaiah 41 and Judges 6 of Jacob and the people of Israel and Gideon, or they were nothing but when you got finished with them, they were an amazing army of God. God, you are looking for the remnant to pick up the swords and to fight the way you've called us to fight. And Lord, forgive me for trying to still fight in my flesh, still trying to fight because I don't believe this or agree with this. Lord, help me to be the warrior you've called me to be like Jesus was that warrior to everybody, for everybody's sake. And Lord, I, I don't fully understand that, but I trust it. Because I believe you're in us and we're being conformed into your image. So, Father, help the people pick up what lies before them in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen.